Um, basically, what, uh, what I generally provide for, um, for the Regional Climate Center is access to the station data as opposed to the gridded data. So we have 100-odd uh, years of station data for the country that uh, a lot of people want to get to, that we want to compare with what the current OBS are. We want to find out what's normal, um, what's changing, what, uh, what people can expect. And our clients are, are everybody. They're, they're from, you know, uh, people who want to know what the frost depth is going to be. So you have engineers, you have uh, lawyers who want to know whether it froze, so you have a slip and fall. Um, you have uh, a lot of people, for instance, in this room who want to look at uh, crop models. And so what we're trying to do is make the, uh, the data that is in the, the National Climate Database accessible to these people. Uh, when I started with the NRCC in the early 90s, uh, for a grad student to do their research project, it took them about six months, eight months to get the data. Um, and then it took them another six or eight months to read out the data, to figure out what the format is. And uh, then they spent another three months working on their project and they were done with their masters. So what we're trying to do is eliminate that. And uh, I think over the last 10 years we've, we've done that. Um, and ACES is the end result of you know, a lot of that work. We're on sort of the third version of uh, ACES access. The, uh, the one two prior, it was based on CORBA. Um, if anybody remembers CORBA, you're dating yourself. Um, we're still using it. Well, we're trying to transition off of it, but we have a few users who will not let go. Uh, so you know, those feature creeps, that's the kind of thing you gotta look at. But um, let me just get started. We'll uh, talk about you know, what is ACES. ACES is the Applied Climate Information System. Um, we turn the climate data into information. And uh, we try to find the, the best available data at any particular station. And some of this time, as it comes in real time, it's uh, raw data. As it's quality controlled and uh, put into the archives, it gets better over time. So we replace that data, and you know, we keep all of the data separate, and then on the fly, on the way out, we give you the best available for any particular point in time. And um, we provide a lot of climatological products. Uh, these are uh, you know, summations, uh, summaries for the, the various periods, and they're done uh, in a climatologically coherent manner. So that uh, if you need to take an average over a period of months, you need to know how many missing values you allow, uh, what do you do with accumulated precips, whether you can group those together, or whether you can de-aggregate them, all of this is done. And like I said, it's for a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, and a lot of them are not climatologically um, sound, or you know, they're, they're just not, that's not their field. So what we try to do is make it easy for them. Um, so this third iteration is uh, completely based uh, over HTTP. We uh, use standard um, web requests, and we use JSON to encode both the, uh, the arguments, the parameters you need to send, and the return type is JSON. Uh, we do support some other return types, but JSON provides enough structure and format that uh, we can return a fairly structured result, and things like comma-separate value just doesn't, uh, doesn't fly for that. Um, it's, uh, it's available at data.rcc-asis.org. That, uh, that's the URL that will get you uh, the documentation, and it's also the base URL for the, uh, the methods that, uh, that you're able to make requests on. Uh, we have three standard uh, basic uh, request types. Station data that returns a, a time series for a single station. Um, Multi-station data that uh, is, returns a group of stations that are either in a bounding box or a state or a county or a climate division, a hydro basin, that kind of uh, grouping. And uh, it will return not only for a single time slice, but it will return a time series for each one of those stations. So any station that happens to meet the criteria that you're looking for, for the date range that you are um, requesting, for the elements that you're requesting, and for that bounding box. It takes that slice and then we'll return that data in one call. And then uh, station meta is, is one way to query uh, the station meta database about uh, where the stations are, what, uh, what their names are, what their IDs, um, without actually asking for the data. So if you need to pre-flight your, your request to see what kind of quantity of stations you're going to get, you can use station meta and then make the uh, multi-station data call on that and get all the data. Or you can just go for it and uh, see what you get back. Um, Setting the parameters for this is uh, complicated because a lot of these requests, you, you do want to do a fair amount of um, analysis on them. So the simple set of parameters is your date range, your start date, end date, um, the station ID. Uh, there's plenty of them. 
you can choose a, a variety of station IDs. This is a, a for an airport for Austin. Um, you could also ask for it by the, um, the WMO number, the co-op ID, the chef identifier. There's, there's just plenty of IDs, and we tend to support a lot of them. Um, we also tend to find the ID that represents the station for the time period you're looking for. For some of the stations, um, uh, the, st um, the NWS LI IDs move around, so they don't always stay in one place. But we, if you're asking for a particular time, that's what we give you. Um, and then the elements. You know, this is a simple definition for the elements, the min temperature, the max temperature, the precip. Um, so what we've tried to do with this interface is to make the simple requests simple. Um, but make the, the more complicated cases um, just possible. But you, you run into a lot, uh, a lot more complexity. Just looking at the elements part of this parameter, um, you still need to specify the, the type of the element you're looking for, the min temperature. But you can also specify different reporting intervals and durations that you're looking at. So for instance, if we're going to try to come up with monthly temperature, monthly minimum temperature, we want to take the mean of those values. So what we have here are three sets of um, uh, different values here. The interval is monthly, the duration is monthly, and the, uh, the reduction is takes the mean of those values. We can also find the minimum, minimum temperature if we want to find when it's really cold. Or if we want, for instance, uh, seasonal, we can ask for an interval of three months, um, a duration of three months, and iterate over those three month periods. So using the, the interval, the duration, and uh, the reduction is uh, sort of how you set up each one of these individual elements. Um, but uh, and other parameters on there, like max missing, you can specify the units that you're looking for. Um, there's a default set, which are the English units, but you can specify metric. Um, so for all of this, um, as I say, it gets complicated. So here's the formatted request in JSON. If we're going to look for monthly mean minimum temperature for Austin, um, for a series of, of six months for this year. So that's, that's the request. Um, and here's what the results. And it's a standard single station, so this is fairly easy. Uh, you get a fair amount of metadata. You get a UID, which is a unique identifier that we use internally to keep stations that are climatologically coherent together. So as a station will change its ID, uh, historically the co-op IDs, uh, when a station is renamed, the number was changed so they would sort in their, their listing. Uh, well, we put them back together with the UID. Uh, and uh, there, like I said, there's every station has lots of different IDs. These uh, sets of numbers here are uh, an indicator of the ID type. Uh, then you've got its location, its elevation, its common name. Um, and then finally, you get to the data. And you can see that uh, it's just numbers. Uh, the, this is JSON formatted, and I'm formatting them as strings because a lot of the use for these returns is just to go right on the web. So we don't want to force people to go back to a floating point, re-round and re you know, precise their numbers. Um, we just go ahead and return it as a string. Um, there's different interfaces. You can go ahead and get the, the raw numbers, but this is the standard. Um, there's also, you'll see the last value in June. Since I specified three missing values is the max and I'd accept. We don't have enough data for the end of June yet. So that value comes back as an M. Um, it's, it's just on this missing. OK? Um, so making these parameters, coming up with them, is really tough. That's why we put together a query builder. Um, I could show you what this looks like. We'll just quickly step over. Uh, here's what it looks like. Um, you could, it gives you all your options, and it builds a query for you. So you can go ahead and run that and then write it into your code. I consider this a failure, um, that it's this complicated. But we've tried really hard to make it simpler. Um, but this is the best we've got. So uh, I, I'm certainly open to suggestions on ways to make uh, the parameterization of these calls easier. But this is what we've got. Um, but back to the talk. Uh, I, I titled this with pandas in there. Um, Making these web requests adds a little bit of boilerplate. It's not complicated, but uh, we can do better. So what I did is I wrote uh, just a little uh, data loader for pandas. Uh, it seems to be the thing to do. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's pretty small. And what it does is it uh, populates a data frame, or actually it populates a panel with a set of data frames, one for each station. 
And um, you know, we there was one question about uh, subclassing data frames. Well, when I wrote this, it wasn't quite ready. It looks like it's going to be in .12. Um, I'm hoping um, if that works, maybe we'll refactor that. So that's why I haven't pushed this to uh, to PyPy. But um, you can take a look at it. It's on GitHub. Um, here it is. It's very simple. Uh, it's very short. Um, and there's a set of examples in there for doing both single station and um, multi-station requests. There's really a uh, little difference between the two. Um, but um, it uh, eliminates a lot of the boilerplate. So um, let's pop over here. And I'm just going to go quick because I'm running out of time. Um, and uh, just load up um, this quick. And um, moving down, here's the request. Here's a simple request that gets uh, a year and a half or two years and a half, or a year and a half of uh, period record data for min temperature, max temperature, and precip for uh, Ithaca, where I'm from. Um, and then that's it. We're, we're done. So this is, like I said, it, makes, it takes away all the boilerplate. You just have an import and a request. Uh, the data frame is. You know, nicely formatted there. It's a standard data frame. It's populated now. Um, this is just the tail of it instead of all the year. Um, you can use pandas to load up some matplotlib effects. Uh, here's the, the min temperature, max temperature over the course of that year and a half. You can see it runs right to today, uh, if you look at the end there. Um, it's pretty noisy. Again, somebody pointed out the standard thing to do here is go ahead and do a rolling mean. You can use the pandas analysis to do that. Um, that brings out some of the, the sort of the trends that we saw over the last year, our really warm March last year. Um, but you don't always want to do that in pandas because the, the mean, that rolling mean, doesn't take into effect all the possible flags that are on the data. There's a few things in there. Temperature, minimax temperature is pretty easy, so I feel comfortable doing that in pandas. Uh, but if you wanted to do it in um, ACES Web Services, this is the request you would make where you've, you're using a daily interval a 10-day duration, a reduction of mean, and um, for each of the elements, min temperature, max temperature. So that's doing it on our server. It's using our methods to do that reduction and bringing over the reduced data. You know, it's, no, it's not actually any smaller. It's the same number of values, but it does that mean. Um, and just quickly stepping through here, it uh, gives you what looks like pretty much the same thing. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see the data goes to the beginning of the, get, the graph. Up here it cut because you didn't have a 10-day window in your original request. It will fill, it'll extend your data if you're asking for 30-day totals or 60-day totals. It'll move your beginning window out so it covers, gives you all the data that's available. So that's one ad, a further advantage. So that's using the, uh, the ACES tools to calculate that moving average. Don't use pandas to do a precip accumulation because it doesn't know about subsequent accumulated values. And a lot of the daily observations, I think this is something, there was a talk, I think it was at PyCon, about looking at um, the data and then realizing that, you know, observed data is really messy. You know, it's just, it, it's really messy. And so with a lot of the precip values, you will have observers that don't observe on weekends. So the Monday value will be the total accumulated over the weekends, or they'll be on vacation. And so if you're doing an accumulation, you have to know about that. And you can't just, you know, do it blindly. Uh, otherwise, you'll have a bunch of missing values that aren't really missing and a bunch of big precepts that aren't really there. Um, so that's where you want to use the analysis that's done in, in ACES to, uh, to do this. So the, an example here is uh, 30, 60, 90, and 120-day precepts uh, for the period of record for Ithaca. Um, we're going to go ahead and sum those up and um, looking at the, the, the totals that end on September 1st. And then let's just use, now that it's in pandas, we're just going to plot it up using matplotlib and do a histogram. So quickly to finish up, we have um, the distribution of precepts for Ithaca for the 120 years of data that we have. And uh, I think that's, that's all I'm going to talk about because we are probably out of time. Um, thanks. Is there any questions? Go ahead. Uh, what we do is we take the NCTC data where in the periods that it's available, 
We add to that on the end the real-time data that we get prior to what they have. And then there is, you know, we're sort of tasked to match NCDC, and they have a, a new data set um, called the Global Climate you know, GHCN, uh, which has a few issues. Um, we're working with them to get it you know, up to speed. We are currently providing the old 3200 data and the GHCN after that, and then the real time. And then as soon as these errors are fixed, we're going to swap over. So this is the entire public, the entire US and stuff. Yeah, we do all of North America. Right. All of this data is currently daily data. Okay. okay. We are adding in sub-daily, hourly and 15-minute data, five-minute data. And what we do is we will accumulate those smaller intervals into daily values or hourly values. Well, and I guess at the interface level, at some point, you need to make a difference between you accumulating the data and the data being already accumulated. Yeah. If, if the data is provided accumulated, we will provide that. We will consider that better. Uh, so, for instance, for monthly data, you want to take a look at the monthly normals. Monthly normals, um, historically, are they're, they're calculated, but nobody really knew how, so that the, you can assume that they're just an observed value. And we use those observed monthly normals when we're looking at monthly totals. So if you're looking at the difference between observed monthly average and normal, we, we use the NCDC normals. Anything else? Yeah. Do you know of any um, open standards that allow for uh, this kind of possibility? We, we've been really trying to track the, you know, the, the, the DAP. Um, there's the, the OGC suite. Um, but really, um, setting up these remote reductions doesn't fit into that model very well. And so we're, we're hoping to be able to, to get some of these things working on our end and then try to, to work with the standards to get that. The data is stored in a black box underneath my desk. Um, no, it, it's stored at all six centers. We have replicated data sets. We keep them all in sync. And uh, primarily for the station data, it's in NetCDFs. And uh, it's all Python using Twisted um, running over to, to serve this up. It, yeah, no, you run into a wall with what, what you can do. And, and really, returning JSON with a JSON request is really simple. And so I think what we're trying to do here is exercise what, what we can, find out what we can do, and then see if we can fit it into some of the standards. Um, so it, it's, it's just, yeah. There's also, I mean, there's server side functions with OpenDAP, too. So that would be another Yeah, but they're also not generally implemented um, and generally available. And, there's not a lot of client side stuff that works with them. Yeah. So I mean, it should certainly be easy to write a client for. But yeah. Yeah. That's you know, and plugging it into OpenDAP is, is one of the goals. Especially one of the things we're doing is some more gridded data. And so once we get to the gridded data, that's what we'd look for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.